Uh, welcome to um, some some of the work that I've been doing. I just wanted that uh, I've been doing with um, the community projects has and has gotten me excited about working more and getting deeply more deeply involved, uh, not just with um, with the uh, Fedora work, but also just lots of things that are associated with the open source and and building images, uh, creating things that other people uh, can use. It's been really fun for me. Uh, I'm a solutions architect, so just a little bit about me. I'm a partner solutions architect for Amazon, and I spend my daytime. Uh, see if my slides will advance. There we go. Uh, I spend my daytime um, uh, working on Red Hat solutions for Amazon and Amazon Web Services customers. So uh, this is pretty dear to my heart, right? Um, and uh, before I worked at Amazon, I worked at Red Hat. Uh, my first computer was a ZX80 that I uh, soldered together by my, with, well, with my own hands and with a lot of guidance from my dad. Um, and uh, um, I live pretty much my whole day in org mode and trying to make everything uh, more like literate programming uh, than it probably should be. Um, so this was an exciting thing for me. Um, to uh, to sort of take on as a as a quest, um, I wanted to build on you know primary goal is I wanted to build with Ansible on Amazon Web Services and to determine where the things were you know where the rough edges were and how I could really uh, um, communicate that back to the Ansible team uh, people like Adam and Jill who are doing really great work uh, around uh, the development while uh, this uh, whole new thing, you know, with uh, collections is happening, it's a, it's a much, it's a much more, uh, um, it's a complicated time, right? So, uh, and then I wanted to uh, demonstrate to myself and maybe even to others that I could participate in uh, an iterative pro pro in iterative progress uh, in a way that as an architect, I don't necessarily get to uh, spend a lot of time doing. So um, I'm sorry, I'm glad to see, Michelle, that you're, you're, you, you also enjoy literate program. It makes me very happy. And hi, Nick. Um, but I have some personal roadblocks, I feel like, because I spend a lot of my time, uh, I spend a lot of my time working on um, solutions that are kind of key in the business area and or in uh, and not as technical as I would like them to be. And then I rely heavily on um, strong engineers like Neil, like Nick, <laughs> um, like Jonathan to, to, um, to help me sort of re, uh, redirect the guidelines around projects that I'm working on. And so this was an opportunity for me to kind of dig into the toolbox and, um, and sort of feel around and find out what, how these things uh, really fit together. Um, so th there's my primary goal. Um, but then as a secondary goal, um, I wanted to really uh, jump out there and make this work for a real project, right? And the real project that I chose was to uh, to build out um, two things. One was a, um, was a, a, a CentOS-based image that I could then publish into the AWS marketplace in China that would match the requirements of the community and be available for Chinese customers where we didn't have a presence uh, at that, at that point. Um, and obviously, you know, working with the team to be, uh, to make this a part of our uh, part of the process. And so here I am with my goals. I want to build a competency in Ansible and a related build process on the distribution of my choosing. And that's namely, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Fedora for all of us who participate here. I wanted to figure out a lot more about the user collections and where uh, the AWS collections, both community and the ones that uh, Adam and Jill, and uh, I can't remember, there's a couple of others who are, who are supporting this beyond just the community at large that's doing the majority of the work for, you know, for the AWS so that I had a very a strong voice internally uh, to talk about this with our engineering teams. And then uh, find an entryway into the tools and techniques that are being used by my friends like Dusty uh, and his teams and Luca uh, to do the work and maybe make myself even a better candidate for helping them to get 
their solutions working uh, than I am today. Um, so, and to continue working on that uh, over time. So as issues evolve, you know, editing this, I want to have a couple, you know, this CentOS image and then I uh, want to be able to publish the, the Microsoft SQL image process so that um, anyone can follow it and it can be uh, be a, um, a a guideline for how to do this in the real world, but then also to be the exact same as the process that's being used internally uh, for for deploying those things uh, for the for the rest of the world to use uh, in the context of AWS. And then, uh, man, my pipeline skills are bad. So this was a super exciting opportunity for me to get to understand more about the way that uh, Jenkins works. Uh, obviously, Jenkins and I have have struggled, and Ansible and I have struggled together uh, over the course of this, and um, and to bring some awareness to some of the best practices around the system that I that uh, I'm finding out from doing this. Um, so here's my milestones. Um, build an Amazon EC2 image using Image Builder. So Image Builder is sort of the the focus. And I know Neil, you and I have had some conversations around this in the past. But you know, with the work around OS Build uh, and the way that it's functioning uh, today, I'm super excited to you know to sort of stay on that track and try to bring that up not only through the uh, through um, the Fedora work, but also into the Red Hat work, and then onto um, onto CentOS, where I feel like a lot of this work is being done. Um, and to be able to do this all in the context of um, sort of a cloud native style, right? Um, and then ultimately deliver this artifact that is the the base AMI for for use, um, and and a, a process for reviewing that um, in such a way that both the the build itself is um, discoverable, uh, just like it is in Koji, and then um, uh, to be able to determine how to improve the real processes, which are the ones that are being used by uh, the Fedora Eng and Rel Eng and uh, the CPE team today. So I got started. Um, and I started working on this in sort of an iterative way, uh, starting with you know just the the hand holding and the the figuring out how things work, installing things over and over again to figure out how I could um, I could um, better uh, um, uh, better build my process in. Uh, but there are so many choices. Um, out there in the world on in what to do, you know what to do and what tools to incorporate and how to test and what what QA looks like I really had to narrow it down and narrow it down quickly became very key to me so finding out uh, finding the tools that I wanted to work with um, quickly instead of figuring out trying to figure out what was the absolute best tool was I thought the right way to go um, so I settled on a couple of things um, I think it just went backwards I did. I go go forward two slides now. Give it a second. Probably should have done this in a PDF. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of choice out there, and just inside of the Fedora teams, you know, there's a lot of things that. Uh, um, that are are very different um, and and extremely malleable, right? Very different kinds of tools that I could have used. Um, so choosing these was was something that uh, was was a was just a, an arbitrary choice, and I kind of want to make make that uh, more or less clear. But I had some goals in mind, so the goals kind of help. Um, Keeping the community project affiliation was really important, and um, and making sure that I was using things that I could see were a part of, you know, at least a component part of the deployment process that um, everyone was using around me um, was uh, something that I wanted to keep in mind and and make make a part of my decisions. Um, 
I also wanted to be able to read whatever it was that I was using. So it was a, so important enough that it be open source because that was a part of my process was figuring out how these things work and then filing bugs on those things, being able to patch them and look at them. And uh, Image Builder and I uh, had a lot of those and I marked a lot of things as bugs and then I marked a lot of things as not a bug after I figured out the, what I was doing wrong. But then I got to be a part of the of, of um, a lot of the test patches and figuring out what was going on upstream and Brian Lane helped me a lot uh, to um, to get to the next steps on on building images with the uh, with uh, Image Builder. And some of the things that I learned, um, up, like app applied di applied directly to those downstream commercial goals that I have, like the like building uh, Rel with uh, Microsoft SQL on it, um, and. And I found some things that were really interesting about the build, build process that uh, I've, I've implemented in the context here. And one of those that I, uh, I don't have really illustrated in my slides, but I wanted to talk about a little bit is that is the, um, the ability to, to provide a, a group of scripts as, uh, from, from, the, from a Git repository um, and present them as an RPM. It, uh, Dump them into a specific location and then execute on that in the in the context of the um, of the blueprint. Um, that was uh, that was a huge assistant. And when I looked uh, when I was looking into the concepts of of building the um, the SQL images, because I couldn't figure out how I was going to get all of that script information material onto a system that was that was um, freshly installed. Without doing some sort of, uh, you know, doing some sort of a crazy cheroot or something else that didn't feel like it was going to fit with the CLI commands, uh, or, or I mean, even the cockpit model for for doing the deployments. Uh, but I was trying to stick to the CLI commands or or anything that I could script in uh, in the context of Python so that I could move forward with the the deployment um, hands off and keep it uh, moving in the long running configuration. So, um, so what does it look like? Um, the uh, so first off, um, AWS Code Pipeline became a, a component part for me because, and it, well, I'll, I'll talk about this later. So I'll talk about that part of it later. Um, so first off, uh, the Ansible scripts are part of the um, part of the deployment. Uh, that's pretty much the trigger. Um, and it hooks back to the um, the GitHub repository uh, through push events to the code pipeline. And the Ansible script runs, and the first thing that that happens with the Ansible script, and of course this is a chicken and the egg problem. Um, the Ansible script has to run once manually. So my goal was to have something that I could run once. It would build the infrastructure that I need, and then once that infrastructure was was built, I would be able to. Um, I'd be able to maintain it with the same scripts. Um, so, uh, so the so first the first off the code pipeline uh, there are Ansible modules to support building the code pipeline itself. Uh, once I mean if you you have to go in and di and dink with the uh, the permissions for uh, the push events if the, if you want to use the push events you'll have to do the authorization from github to the to the code pipeline so that it can see your um, so it has access to the repositories um, and then uh, find the the images that I want to use in the current state or in the state that I'm using uh, image builder I'm you know obviously OS build I should be able to use when when I'm using that. I should be able to uh, use a single uh, distribution version to do more than one uh, one other version. But for now, I need an individual image builder instance for each one of the um, each one of the distribution versions that I want to build for. And that means I also need one for each one of the version architectures that I need to build for. Um, something that I found uh, kind of interesting there was was that uh, the uh, you know obviously I had to craft 
a little bit more handily the um, uh, the configuration. I've got some snippets here. Let me let me see if I can pull something up and in, in uh, the Emacs here, so you can see it. So here in the server in the server definition for the Jenkins, and there's a few variables that are missing, um, but I. But I thought it'd be interesting to kind of show this. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make uh, an one or an important distinction in the way that this uh, Ansible script works. Yeah, it, exactly, Neil. So, um, but the Neil was grumbling about the lack of of cross arch support. It gets complicated, and so good news is is that uh, I have what I need to pull that out. And so where's my Tommy definition? There we go. So if we so if I have an instance arch, I can I'm using that instance arch in the definition of the of the um, the Ami query. Uh, so grabbing these, thanks Dusty for making this so easy to review, and. Uh, um, and then grabbing the instance architecture that I'm expecting to build for. Uh, once I have the instance architecture, I can make a decision uh, in the var variables about um, about the uh, uh, the configuration. But I've got it here, uh, specifying the instance arch in the filters, and then same in the name. I obviously could have gotten away from doing it one place or the other, but uh, but I've got it in both, and I'm I'm comfortable with that. And then uh, the Jinja template uh, functionality was something that I had not worked with previously, but then started to work with in a in a, more of a um, an interesting way. And I found a whole lot of ways to do this. And this is this is one of those places where I feel like I really need to dig in. That you know, it's it's the place where you'll see the most uh, functionality in in uh, Ansible uh, go the way of uh, one line scripts where you said something into grep and then awk it right uh, there's so many places in here where you can you can just uh, transform data in into in different directions uh, so so that's a an essential component part of of the deployment of the um, of the Jenkins server um, also this is interesting here the there's a there's a number of these modules, so from the collection, uh, the Amazon collection, and then there's some from the community collection. And it's not clear which direction to go with which one today. And I feel like that probably will clear up more uh, in the future. But it's a, it was an interesting experience to to go to go back in and see where those are. So this is a little bit more uh, about the pipeline itself and what I'm what my goals are and and the experience around that are. Um, I've got an extra helmet in here. Sorry about that. So the helmet is an IAM role. And this is something that I, I, I'll, I'll point out a little bit more, but but um, I'm associating an IAM role with the Jenkins instance because the Jenkins instance is running my Ansible playbooks. So um, so the so initially you have to run the Ansible playbook from somewhere, but it doesn't have to and but next time it can be, you know, the Ansible playbooks will land on the Jenkins instance or, or in the in the jobs themselves, right? So it'll land in the pipeline. And uh, this is essentially what's going on. So here's me and anybody else who wants to help me uh, get better at what I'm doing. So it's, it's, uh, so Jonathan, it's not yet. Uh, Jonathan asked if this was somewhere public that we can access the playbook. Um, it's somewhere that I can share it with you because uh, I would be super excited to have you, um, to have any of you help me uh, get the work done. But um, but right now I have uh, I have some question I'm I have questionable security on the on the uh, artifacts that are in the in the repository. So I want to make sure that I'm not sharing out old secrets. Yeah, I know. Neil gave me the the cross the the side side eye <laughs> on that one. 
Um, but yes, I'll get it out. I'll make sure it's available. And eventually it will be, a, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, it will be available to everyone to look at. So the way it works now is you update the GitHub repository. And actually I've got it split into two repositories. There's one repository that's there for the image builder to collect the information that's associated with uh, the, the builds. Um, so for SQL, for the SQL server, there's the, there's the get repository specific to the, the build of the, um, of the repos. So, um, so the instances that I'm using are cloud access instances and the cloud access instances come up, I register them uh, with, with Red Hat and then, um, and then I'm, uh, doing a full repo sync onto the image builder instance. I have to use a pretty beefy instance to get the image builder configuration to work because uh, it either has to be metal or one of the larger, um, more more sophisticated Nitro instances uh, to get the to get the virtual machine configuration to run in a timely manner. I mean, I could run a smaller instance and and for longer, but why? If I'm gonna just gonna shut it down. Um, then the the so from the from there the the um, the pipeline push event happens in the code pipeline and the code pipeline is initiating uh, a longer run on the uh, on the uh, Jenkins uh, server. So the Jenkins server only has the standard port open. Uh, I haven't done anything to secure it uh, at this point. Um, that'll that's uh, you know. A roadmap item for for a different time, or for someone who knows how to do it in seconds instead of me doing it in hours. So, <laughs> so um, uh, the Ansible playbook then runs and creates generates the instances, um, and you see the, lor the little Lorax here, a little history on the on the image builder. Um, the instances are then uh, generated using the blueprints that are in the configuration from the uh, from the GitHub, and the blueprints themselves are um, are just pulled from S3. So um, the uh, the uh, the whole goal of this obviously is to have uh, several of these instances running, creating. Uh, either RHEL 7 and a RHEL 8 or CentOS 7, CentOS 8 uh, images with the with the, com the component parts. And then to have um, essentially a little solutions builder here so that we can vary the, the blueprints that are being used and produce some very interesting sort of collections of, you know, what I'd love to do. And this is my kind of my goal here on what I was excited about was was um, was building a way to have solutions uh, that are already there in the Fedora, um, the Fedora um, repertoire or, or um, scope, and to provide uh, images of those that can be shared to um, to customers in ways, and really not customers, but everybody users who want to who want to uh, leverage that in the context of the of the cloud, and and to provide kind of a, a a guideline model for an architecture that spins up, uh, works, and then uh, and then uh, spins itself down, but is still fully functional. Um, because, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So uh, the and then to have uh, an associated role for this instance here, so that we don't have to ever provide any of the the de like any of the um, credentials that would be required. So, almost everything that you read about um, about using uh, Amazon EC2 has somewhere where you're storing, you know, in a semi or per semi permanent or permanent way, credentials that then are out there in the big um, in in the big world with uh, with no, you know, with with little safety net. And of course, we don't want, you know, I, nobody wants that. So Neil, you had a question. You said, "Is the idea to have a layering model for producing AMIs?" Yes, the idea is actually to have a way to produce artifacts, artifacts that are not just AMIs. I mean, it, the the goal is to be able to produce ISOs, to produce anything that people, you know, that that you would want in the same way that you would do that in uh, in the context of Koji, right? So 
I mean, I, I believe that there's nothing, there would be nothing stopping me from just, just outlining and, and deploying a pipeline uh, with the, or deploying a, um, a request to build the images with the scripts that Dusty has in place today, um, like with the CoreOS builder or, or whatever, you know, or, or the image builder in the context of, of the CPE. But um, this is, this is kind of a, a uh, I want I want to understand this model as much as I as as uh, you do, and some of that requires some building, right? Building on my part. So, um, using the AWS code pipeline. Um, so jumping right into uh, building out, and I know it's fairly simple to build a, a standard pipeline configuration for Jenkins, but it's not really on my radar of things that I need to be uh, deeply involved in. So I chose to to take this um, to take this path with the code pipeline to begin with because I felt like I was I needed to crawl before I was walking. And I also needed to have something that was there available and servicing uh, the configuration. Um, at times when I didn't have any hardware in place and wasn't really ready to um, uh, to deploy um, or what didn't really wasn't really active, right? So let's say there's no changes in the GitHub repository. There's no modifications to the code that's associated, you know, that's intermediate. Um, I don't have any way to. I, I don't have any need for for infrastructure. I want that to go away. Um, and then to integrate with as many the the tools that I mean, so knowing that many people were not going to have the same kind of limitations around Jenkins, not going to have the same limitations around, I wanted to have uh, around the other tools that I had chosen. I wanted to make sure that um, that the people who were willing to help could jump in and and really help me um, uh, ex not only expand my understanding but also to expand the the capability and and the uh, the ability for other people to use it, um, and there's some there's like some cool tools out there that I've, I I that I learned about just you know in the past day, uh, like TMT, like the test tool um, that uh, uh, that Miles and those guys were working on, and 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 it's pretty amazing uh, how much of that could extend the the functionality and something like that. Code pipeline? No. It, so Neil asked, "Is code pipeline Jenkins based or something else?" It's something else. So it's a it's it's actually based on an internal tool that is called Pipelines uh, for for Amazon, and it was originally written, I believe, it was it's still written in in Java, um, but it was uh, but it was originally, I mean, now it's written at scale in microservices, and and uh, um, uh, so it is kind of native to the AWS microservice model, um, integrating into a whole lot of other tools on the back, back end. Uh, okay, I accept that. Um, but it's a, but it's a, um, when I say that, I mean that, that, the, that by itself, it's not Jenkins based. And in fact, benefits from an extension uh, to using Jenkins for standard pipeline uh, technology. You can build your own plugins for it, but, it's a, uh, it's a, um, it, in, in my opinion, uh, it is a, a fairly simple uh, tool for the process, and it expects you to um, incorporate custom components into your build process. And if somebody else has a has a different opinion of that, I'd I'm, I'd love to hear it. But and like like when you're so, not yet. Well, not yet. Yeah, there's so it's very limited in the scope of the of the um, repositories that it will use. So you can uh, having a native Git repository is not supported. Having a GitHub repository is supported. Having a code commit repository is supported. Having an S3 object that has uh, SNS notifications is supported. Um, but um, but like I said, it's it's one of those things that I thought was a really good, uh, it's a like a really great fit for where I am today, and that that may end up being replaced by other open tools, just because uh, my 
my goal is obviously open default by default to open. So the long runs, uh, so all the things that are doing here um, was uh, was a community decision. So, you know, I want to learn, I obviously want to learn with my friends, right? Like this, this is not as, uh, as simple for, you know, for a lot of, for me as it should be maybe. And, and I think that if I give a lot of people an opportunity to, to, um, to really shine that I get a lot out of it. And, and so, um, that's, uh, uh, that's something I'm really grateful for. And I think, I think we all are grateful for the mentorship that this, this project has brought to us all. Um, but it was a great opportunity for me to reach out and say, Hey, here's a simple tool where you can hone your mentors, mentoring skills. Um, and I can benefit. So, so, um, so, so there's, you know, outside of the GitHub flavors like Travis and Bamboo and all that, there was, there was a, you know, it's, it's a pretty solid rock solid choice, right? GitLab has their own hooks and everybody's got uh, some way that they can integrate with it. It's right. It's, it's the, it's the legacy soldier um, that keeps, keeps us all, uh, keeps us all working and keeps CentOS in check, you know, and, and, and uh, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of benefit to, to working with it. Um, obviously, you know, it, it facilitates my, my needs. And AWS batch was something that I, something else that I, uh, that I toyed with the idea of, of, um, of putting in here because it also is great for scalable work and uh, like massively scalable work it's used for in a lot of cases where um, where people are using are driving parallel uh, computation in uh, ways that are different than they used to right it's not just your basic um, uh, batch scheduler like uh, platform or uh, lava right um, so um, so I, I considered it pretty heavily because it's one of those things that I hear a lot. I hear a lot of customers say, oh, well, we have thousands of virtual machines and it's going to cost us, you know, a lot more money to run these thousand virtual machines on the cloud. And when I look back at them, I see that they're purpose built, right? They have little, they have like very specific functionality and that keeping them around isn't really necessarily in any kind, you know, in anyone's best interest. It's just a good thing to have have those purpose built configurations. And so I thought this might be an interesting place for me to understand better how I could help people um, uh, disaggregate those workloads and understand how to save how to save money in the way that they do it. Um, and so call, I mean, I'd love to so long picture, I think of the Serge's work on Koku and the things that are out there that uh, um, that are integrating uh, cost analysis and and billing uh, review into the into their process and and val like uh, billing alerts. I'd love to see you know I'd love to sort of build that into this process so that people can understand exactly what it is that they're getting for their for their you know in the opportunity and make something that I think is a good reference architecture in the in the context of Fedora and and Fedora based tools. Okay, so uh, so here's the here's my spoiler, uh, which is that I'm not done. Like I was super excited to 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 do some uh, to do some uh, big time demos for the for for Flock, but I haven't made it. So let's talk about this as being the first iteration of the talk, and the first iteration of the tool. So I mean, I can show you some of the things that I've done, and and we'll we'll do that if if you're if we have time and you're interested. But the but the um, uh, but the truth is is that I'm still running a lot of this by hand and I'm not getting any of the Jenkins stuff built but in an automated fashion so uh, it it's uh, burning a hole in my pocket to to get a to get more time to work on this um, only building the image builder so far and producing fundamental images for like our instances I guess I should say instances for CentOS 7 and 8 and the upstream Red Hat 7 and 8 so now I can create a, a CentOS 7 and a CentOS 8 image in either architecture 
on and a seven and an eight on either architecture. I don't really feel like I have to worry about doing that on the Fedora side because Dusty's doing it all for me. But um, but to have those with some customized configurations, the same thing, you know, I would love to do the same thing in terms of the spins, but I don't have, I haven't really uh, pulled in the, the spin configuration so that I was just churning out the machine images. Um, but at some point I would love to see that. Uh, and then uh, creating sort of a state equals stop or a state equals terminated or a state equals absent, I guess, um, for the EC2 instances hasn't really happened yet. And one of the things that I, I do want to experiment with, it's not really available yet, but it's still some, I mean, it's, it's open. There's, it's an, it's an open uh, item to integrate EC2 hibernate into uh, support into onto AWS within the context of Fedora. So uh, Neil, I hope you'll review that uh, spec file when I, when I get it polished for, for, uh, uh, for addition. So the easy to hibernate, and I'll, while the, the page is changing, the uh, I, one of the things about the easy to hibernate that was exciting for me is that uh, hibernation in the context of a server and definitely in the context of a cloud server is something that's fairly new. But I think it's kind of catching on, and there are people who are using it in, in the context of spot instances. So they're like, hey, you know, this is a lazy process. So I don't have to really think about whether or not I want to do it. I just would can stand up the service, and then um, and then I can look at you know I can I can look at the the spot price, and then when the spot price is right, I just uh, wake the instance. The instance continues to work if the if for some reason there is a, a you know there's a, a a spike in price, then that can go back into the hibernation state and continue forward. There are some challenges there that have been kind of interesting because that we've run into, and I think are kind of uh, sort of notable. Uh, one is the SE Linux policy around uh, writing to a swap file. It turns out that it's better, uh, obviously it's a better practice to not force customers to have like a second volume for um, for hibernation. You want to, you don't want to, uh, create a swap volume by creating a monthly bill for an additional device that's going to hold a swap file, uh, a, a swap partition. So the swap partition itself um, is uh, kind of rolled into um, in, in or it's it's a it's basically a file gets created as a swap file and that swap file gets written to. Well, it turns out uh, XFS isn't really friendly to uh, writing to that swap file in a block fashion with transparent huge pages. So you have to turn, you have to move the move from the default configuration of, of THP on to M advise uh, so that the um, so that the huge pages aren't used in the in the transfer of the of the configuration. That uh, is that's a great first step in preventing uh, file system con uh, corruption. But then the SE Linux domain for hibernation for the for the shutdown, um, that domain doesn't have context to write to the swap file. So uh, any attempt to run an actual hi uh, uh, hibernation uh, lands you in a space where you're you're uh, you have to relax the SE Linux con. Uh, context. So um, here's something that I have, I found very interesting. So one, you know, we're just in the early stages of the community um, in the, and the supported, um, did I go backwards? I did. Uh, we're just in the first stages of, of the Ansible support for uh, collections. And while it's gone on for now for a little while from, you know, for over the course of the you know, early in 2.8 and then now in, or, or late in 2.8 and now in 2.9. The 2, and 2.9 has brought, uh, brought us the first uh, releases of this. And like I said, I'm super excited about uh, where this is going and um, advocating quite a bit for 
a more a more active participation on you know from the from the teams that are responsible for these uh, for the services underneath these modules, uh, so that we have some full support. But for now, we have really great community support for a lot of the configurations, and um, and just building in the support for or, or building this into my process of of installing. Uh, to the local directory has been uh, beneficial in running the Ansible configuration. So now I'm I'm building those Ansible configurations, and the local the local setting I'm not setting them up in uh, just uh, across the system with uh, with the Ansible playbook. I'm uh, uh, setting them up with the uh, uh, with a config that has a current working directory as a base. I think that's the right way to do it. Um, the system role for Image Builder, um, I can't remember the name of the guy who's who's responsible for this, uh, but I can Ansible Galaxy it into uh, um, to support, I think. So if I do an Ansible Galaxy. Action info X system roles image builder Is that wrong? Or is it info collection? Yes, it's an Ubuntu laptop. It's my work laptop, Neil. Uh, so Neil asked if I was using an Ubuntu laptop. Um, my uh, my Fedora laptop has four gig of memory, and my Ubuntu laptop has 32 gig of memory. So uh, when I thought about where I wanted things to go, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, Got to be in here somewhere. So, um, yeah, that'll give you an idea of what I'm doing to run this. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. I can't, like I said, I can't remember who's. Um, I can't remember the command. Anyway. Um, so this, the image builder role was was uh, critical, but then the other thing that was uh, that I thought was really important and something that I thought was interesting to everyone was was that the storage role in the context of building for uh, uh, for AWS is tough. And Dusty, we've talked about this, and this is in the this goes back to the the um, the UDEV rules that Luca was writing for CoreOS. And that we were talking about with uh, talking about the upstream bug for for this, um, where the devices in uh, in uh, on EC2 the EBS volumes they come in as uh, pseudo PCI devices in in the way that the hyperconvergence works. Um, Terry Bowling, thanks Neil, um, and it's fabulous. It's, you know, it's it, he's iterating over it. Uh, constantly, and he's doing a much, you know, like increasing the uh, the robustness of the of the um, the playbook all the time. So I'm super grateful to the work that he's done, um, and just want to call that out. Uh, so so the storage devices, though, um, the way that we call them out in the configuration uh, as a device, the device names are old school devices slash dev slash SDG SDF right it's, and but that enumeration doesn't carry over into the operating system uh, once you get into the operating system that that device name the 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 device name that you've associated with the EBS volume the the ID uh, goes away um, it's in, it's in the NVMe info for the for the device but it's no longer uh, but it's no, but it's not a sim link, right? So whatever you named it, that doesn't exist. Um, you have to go back and dis and rediscover that, or um, use uh, the UDEV rules that Luca pr 
that Luca provided in CoreOS um, to uh, um, to develop that. And I actually have a copper uh, copper repository for um, for the EC2 utils that came out of uh, um, the uh, uh, um, the the Amazon Linux instances. So I built uh, built this EC2 net utils. Uh, so that it can could include both the 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 network utilities for uh, managing the the Ethernet or the uh, network interfaces, and then this the EC2 utils, uh, so that you could uh, enumerate the devices. But Lucas rules, uh, in my opinion, are um, uh, they are more. Um, I think the uh, they're they're simpler, right? So he he creates a simpler rule and gets the same result. So um, I would encourage you, if you want to, to you know, to to leverage the this package for uh, doing it the way that Amazon is doing it in uh, Amazon Linux. But if you uh, but if you want to see uh, a very effective and efficient way of doing it, I think that Luca B um, made uh, made a great um, Made a great set of rules. So, um, well, I've got a heavy a heavy hand on this uh, on this pad. Um, so the so storage so the storage configuration becomes rather important. So one of the other things is is that the volumes that are that you're writing the um, the images to is a volume that you can restore from snapshot. Uh, this is not something that I've put in uh, just yet, but it's it's on my my wish list for things that I need to do, and that is that I, um, the uh, one day this will advance. Um, is that this the uh, the um, the devices themselves? have to be enumerated correctly. You have to go back in and discover them. Uh, the NVMe CLI gives the information that you need, but if you're in Ansible, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily something that you're using and, unless you install the NVMe CLI. Uh, so this role storage, you have to remember to go back and uh, reestablish what the devices are or add the EC2 utils or uh, Luca's uh, UDEV rules. Um, into into the system to uh, to get the right uh, the right device information, and I think that's handy just uh, in general, not uh, not just specifically in the context of this uh, this configuration. So I I pointed out that I did the IAM role uh, in associated with the Jenkins instance, and that was uh, that was because permanent credentials or what I say here are a waste of your time. Uh, the same ins the same instance you have for Ansible engine can drive your Jenkins server, and uh, it's possible that we could do an AWX server um, at some point in that and or or an Ansible tower and and uh, um, and use that for callback functions. Um, one of the things that I think is completely underutilized in in the context of uh, public cloud is uh, the cloud config and cloud init. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, ignition, Dusty. I'm talking about ignition. Um, so uh, bringing that whole process together is uh, is something that I think is really important. So um, there's nothing, and there's nothing stop us for, from killing the entire architecture and leaving one uh, pipeline in place. Um, and with that, I'll. I'll, uh, I, I've left two minutes for questions. So Neil asked, does AWS have a fancy native way to configure ignition configs? No, uh, the answer to that is that uh, in, almost, in almost all the documentation I see, I see a lot of um, just um, like stepping away from the, the cloud config or um, or the, um, the 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 JSON configuration that you would require for an ignition, 
uh, config, the all the way down to just e issuing uh, bash commands on the uh, at the user data level. And um, if you look at uh, some of the things that are done with the the um, uh, the EFS team, they have done some things that are similar to what I would expect to have happen in vendor data, but they inject it into the user data configuration in the uh, at launch, and um, and it is always done in a scripted fashion rather than yeah, that's ex uh, Neil, your your sentiment there is is exactly like mine. So I uh, tend to, and I and I have I think I have an example uh, right here. Um, yeah, so I tend I tend to start and end with so uh, I don't have an ignition script up right now, so just bear with me. Um, but uh, but I'm doing this on like I said, CentOS seven and and Rel seven and eight. So um, so uh, for me, the most you know the most important thing is to is to ensure that uh, um, that the configuration is set so that you can um, uh, uh, so that it can be read by CloudInit and I can get it out of the analyze. So if I need to if I need to do a cloud init analyze, I can I can figure out what happened. Um, so uh, so no no shebangs for me. If you're doing a run command, it should happen in the context of a list like it's supposed to in sub process. Anything else? Any other questions? Thanks. I'm I'm super excited about it, and and uh, uh, I I can tell you right now, yeah. <laughs> but it's getting better, Neil. I I so you grumble about it. Let's build a little bit. But I tell you, uh, you know, everybody is getting a lot more excited about it. Lars, you know, with Lars uh, in there doing a lot of work on it, it was yeah, it is. Um, but but it carries that legacy, and the you know a lot of the things are going in the right direction. I think and. And there's there's a lot of focus on on being able to build a much broader set of tools with um, with just the one you know or broader set of, of results with the one tool. So I'm I'm really excited about it, and uh, we'll continue to work on on integrating it and then building this iterative process so that we can all look at it together. So I'm gonna I'll submit this talk again, and we'll look at what it looks like the next time. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for for participating. I really enjoyed this, and and I hope we can um, we can work on it together more. And I'm always on IRC. I'll just say that. So if anybody wants to reach out, um, super happy to uh, um, to respond back. And I'm Davdunk everywhere. <laughs>